Hey there, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, happy Fed Day. No change to the Fed Fund's target rate. Chair Powell reflecting on the impact of higher interest rates. Stocks rally post-Fed with the S&P up over 1%, back above that 4,200 level. We'll be joined by Katie Stockton of Fairlead Strategies, looking at some weekly charts, putting things into perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller, and I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close. Happy November as we break down the uh, markets here. As we progress through the fourth quarter, through earnings season, through another Fed meeting, a lot of things to uh, unpack and uncover. At the end of the day, I would argue the charts are such a great way to try to make sense of things, particularly in uncertain times. We can talk about what could happen or what should happen, the potential ripple effects or side effects of all sorts of decisions that are being made and all sorts of macroeconomic activity. At the end of the day, the charts tell you what is happening. As Ralph Akampour, one of my mentors, would say, price is fact. You can't restate price. This is where buyers and sellers came together. So let's analyze those prices as trends and focus on the message the market is uh, providing uh, to us in the form of technical analysis. Let's get to the charts here as we start our market recap. Before we get to the charts and talk about some of the individual patterns that we're reviewing, I want to start with a poll question. We asked you recently, where will the QQQ be one month from today? 10% up, 10% down, somewhere in the middle. The most common response, 30%, 37% of you, that is between 0 and 10% higher. Think about, we're asking this question kind of, uh, you know, end of October, so that would mean the end of November, about four weeks out. You know, where would we be? Between 0 and 10% higher, I probably would have to agree, and I would say that is based on a counter trend move. We have a, a great guest today, uh, Katie Stockton, you'll get her take on what's happening here. But when you when you look at the trend in the S&P 500 and you look at the trend in the NASDAQ, you kind of have this really, I mean, almost ideal downtrend channel. And this is what I mean by that. Look at the chart of the QQQ. We're going to draw a trend line. So I'm basically going to click here, drag down to that point. I'm going to make it just a little bit easier to see like that. Now, on the stock charts platform, what you want to do is select the line. But instead of clicking it and moving it on the Mac keyboard, if you hit the command button, and click and drag, you actually get a parallel line. There's your stock charts uh, hidden secret for the day. Draw first trend line, hold down the command key, tap on that trend line, you draw a parallel line. And that's a great way to kind of create this uh, channel. It's a really good way to see if there's a really consistent pattern to the trend that you're analyzing. So if you look at what's happened with the Qs from mid-July to now the beginning of November, it's been a very consistent pattern of lower highs, and then lower lows. And look how, besides this little September aberration here, other than that, incredibly consistent. And so is it reasonable to expect we bounce off of this lower trend channel and trade higher? Absolutely. So I think what you need to do, and we've talked about how this market is guilty until proven innocent. I would argue that that medium term trend is still lower until we can get above resistance levels, right? Get above these trend lines based off of the previous highs. I think for the Qs, I think for the SMH, the semiconductor ETF have a very similar setup. I would set an alert for QQQ above 370 because that would actually accomplish two different things. Number one, it would be the um, uh, chart gets above this trend line resistance, and it would also mean we get above the October high. And so getting above 370 kind of gets both of those things checked off. And I would say at that point, you could make a decent argument that the trend is now, uh, the medium term trend is now more, uh, more positive. Also look at the momentum, right? The RSI has gone down to that bearish range, not getting above 60 on these little uh, rallies here in August. And in October, you want to see a break above trend line resistance on stronger momentum. And that would indicate what we call a change of character. So not there yet. And that's why I think a, a rally in this particular, you know, tactical time frame makes a ton of sense. And, and you could argue still within a bearish tape, you get sort of those short term rallies, those counter trend rallies. Uh, and again, breaking above 370, I think on the QQQ maybe changes uh, to something different. So I, I get the argument of between 0 to 10% higher. And again, the point of those poll questions, by the way, is not just to have you predict the future, which is in, in a lot of ways incredibly difficult, if not impossible to do. It's to get you thinking about different alternatives. What would happen if the Qs go up 10 plus percent higher? What would it mean if they go 10 plus percent lower? How would that impact your portfolio? How would you manage risk or manage opportunities in those different environments? 
stretch your thinking a little bit, and then you'll be better prepared for whatever scenario plays out. Let's keep going with our market recap, looking at the major averages. As I mentioned, nice update, and then, you know, big bounce after uh, Powell's press conference. Of course, no change to uh, the Fed funds target rate. I don't think that's a surprise. I mean, the market was basically pricing in no change, really pricing in not a big uh, a probability of a change uh, again in December. Markets basically in, uh, pricing in that uh, rates remain steady through year end, and then we revisit in the new year. I mean, just my initial takeaway listening to Powell's press conference, it was a lot of just very measured comments about, you know, leaving the door open to making additional changes. But, you know, he talked a lot in the, particularly in the press conference, about the impact of higher rates. In a lot of ways, the rates going higher, bonds selling off, has I, arguably sort of had a lot of the impact that um, that they would be trying to do uh, managing the short end of the curve. But the longer end of the curve coming up, it's making things more expensive. And so as a result, you're starting, you know, arguably to see some of the slowdown that you might expect given uh, what the Fed's doing. So higher rates really making uh, the, uh, the uh, economy slow down a little bit. And that's kind of what they were uh, hoping to, uh, to accomplish. So with all that in mind, the S&P finishing pretty strong here. Last hour, kind of choppy, but a nice bounce uh, around 2.33 p.m. So the S&P up to 42.38, slightly below that, up about 1.1%. The NASDAQ composite up 1.6%. So leading the way higher, the FANG sectors, once again, at the top of the list. We haven't seen that particular configuration probably in a couple of weeks of, uh, of the Magnificent Seven, the growthy sectors at the top of the list, but that's what you'll find today. Mid caps, small caps uh, up as well. Small caps lagging behind as they have often in a growth-led uh, rally. And the VIX, Look how low the VIX has actually gotten today, down another point, 1.3 points, it turns out, to around 16.9. So well below that 20 threshold that we've been talking about as that basic measure of, you know, uh, high volatility or low volatility. We're kind of back below that, uh, that, uh, that important level. Looking at interest rates, a lot of red looking at the yield curve, uh, pretty much across the board from short end to long end, uh, kind of drifting lower as bonds rallied today. Uh, around the press conference, you have the 10-year yield uh, finishing lower to around 479. The 30-year yield, the long bond yield, below 5%. Uh, bond prices moving higher, the TLT up 1.8%. Uh, the dollar index, no real uh, change from yesterday's close. Looking at commodities, uh, a bit of red, a bit of green. The gold uh, ETF GLD down about a third of a percent. Silver essentially flat from yesterday. Copper slightly higher, crude oil slightly lower, so not Significant changes, although natural gas prices uh, came down a bit. Overall, commodity uh, complex kind of holding steady today. Finally, cryptocurrencies, a choppy, noisy period. Bitcoin actually spiked above 35,000, currently around 34,650. We'll call that Ethereum prices around 1850. So for now, we had that big breakout above 31,000. Nice move up to around 35,000. For now, we've sort of stabilized around there. Maybe that is the new level that the market is telling you uh, Bitcoin uh, should be at. And again, the catalyst there is this expectation that investors, more broadly speaking, have greater access to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin through ETFs that are actually uh, holding uh, Bitcoin as part of it, sort of like a GLD for cryptocurrencies. Not yet. And this, again, we're still waiting for any sort of confirmation on that. But you're certainly seeing some optimism, some re renewed optimism in the chart of Bitcoin, uh, I would say very, very much as a result of that expectation, that optimism. Looking at the sectors today, growth at the top of the list, uh, technology, communication, services, consumer discretionary, one, two, three. The XLK was up almost 2% today. Communication services, one and a half. Consumer discretionary, 1.2%. At the bottom of the list, you have energy down about a quarter of a percent, followed by consumer staples and materials essentially flat for the day. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P 500. Just look at how today's move fits into the overall trend that we've been talking about. Today was an interesting day for a couple of reasons. Number one, we got back above 4,200. And we talked about that level so many times. It's that purple shaded area that you see on my chart. That lines up to the February high uh, from earlier this year. That was when, you know, really the first time we, we focused on that level because it took us four months to finally once again get above that level uh, at the end of May, beginning of June. Uh, then you can see that also was about a 31.8% retracement of the way down around 4,180 or so. Uh, and the 200-day moving average, again, drifting above there, currently around 42.40, uh, but kind of all in that range. So today's rally, and really the rally uh, this week, after Friday's uh, you know, closing at the lows for the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, kind of progressing higher. Uh, and, uh, and again, a nice, a nice rally, uh, a tactical rally at least, 
uh, for off of the uh, off of the lows around 4100. And the question is, you know, do we regain the 4, the 200-day uh, moving average? We traded up to it today. We didn't manage to close above the 200-day, but that's certainly a level I would be watching. Above there, you've got trend lines off of the recent highs. And you know, again, I, I like to think of a chart as guilty until proven innocent, or innocent until proven guilty. I would argue this chart guilty until proven innocent. A lot of reasons why the market could rally from here. I'd love to see a follow through above some of those trend lines off the highs. Once that sort of breakout happens, then I think you can talk a little more confidently about uh, upside potential because you've already seen that uh, sort of initial sign of accumulation. So for now, I think at least a counter trend rally off of the lows around 4,100. Let's keep an eye on this uh, purple shaded area we've had on our charts still very much in play uh, here as we begin the month of November. Just to continue on here, some of the charts in the uh, in the pack that I'd love to review with you. You know, in terms of breadth conditions, again, breadth overall, I would argue, still weak. But in the short term, the breadth conditions got so bombed out. We had Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Genuity on our show yesterday. We talked about some of those breadth readings that had gotten so low. You can see that uh, we got down to around 25% of S&P stocks above their 200-day. Now it's around 34%. So again, think about what that means. Just this week, we've had 10% of the S&P, about 50 stocks, that were below their 200-day and now have gone back above it. So more and more of that would tell me more and more we're in a broader recovery. And I think getting above the 50% level is probably the most important. In terms of stocks above their 50-day, we're around 25%, and that's up from around 10% at the end of last week. So you've certainly seen initially uh, some moves off of the lows, some stocks regaining the 50-day. Again, more and more of that validates the fact that we're in a broader recovery. So these breadth indicators, I would say, still in the bearish range, but improving off of the lows. And I think that's uh, a telling change. We mentioned the McClellan Oscillator, and I have to tell you, I'm not going to change the colors just yet, but I'm holding to see maybe tomorrow if we would do that. We uh, have another I think based on today's close, it looks most likely the McClellan Oscillator will finish above zero again today, given the strength that we saw into the end of, uh, end of the trading day. So it most likely will uh, color code this uh, bullish green here very, very soon. Now, what's interesting is the last two times we've had the McClellan Oscillator dip above the zero level was in late August. And in early October, the second week in October, those both times were basically these tradable highs, right? These swing highs before the resumption of the uh, of the downtrend. So keep an eye on this. If we do sort of continue the McClellan Oscillator higher, recognize what's happened here the last couple of times. That's been, you know, sort of the story of the decline in the third quarter and now into the fourth quarter. Look for something to change, right? Look for what we call a change of character. Can we stay above the zero level for the McClellan Oscillator? That would tell you, again, another way of confirming that the breadth indicators are continuing to improve or continue to get a little bit, a little bit better. Now, it's, all, it's interesting, you know, if you look at some of the indicators here, um, you know, some of them still uh, fairly weak, but improving. The bullish percent index on the S&P 500 still below the 30% level. This is an indicator that I like to watch. It's based on uh, point and figure charts and basically saying out of the 500 members of the S&P, how many of them are in a bullish point and figure signal at, uh, at currently or, or most recently. Uh, their signal is currently around 27%, uh, up from around 23%, but not back above 30 just yet. And look to see when we get out of that uh, that uh, green shaded area, those uh, what we might call an oversold condition. Because previously, those have been some of the more significant lows that we've observed over the last uh, you know 18 months and going back further uh, as well. So you know, very close to a buy signal there using this particular indicator, not quite there. So again, a nice initial rally off the lows this week so far showing signs of strength. I think things like the Treasury auction today, uh, the Fed meeting today, other things that have the potential to shock the market to the downside have not done so. You're seeing continued optimism and rallies, uh, strong closes through this, uh, this week so far. Let's wrap up looking at some individual names. As a reminder, I really like using the market dashboard on stock charts to focus on some of the names on the move. And these, this is where I spend, uh, you know, I glance down at this area of the, uh, of the website often because I look at the S&P 500s, the names that are gaining and the names that are, uh, that are dropping, which are the ones really uh, having significant moves. Uh, and, and again, at the very least, you want to be aware of some of these uh, moves. And things to highlight, just to sort of, uh, sort of indicate for you, you know, we've talked about the weakness in areas like home builders, and I think one of the arguments for weaker economic conditions, for concerning developments in the market, I think a chart like PHM, charts like Lennar and uh, the ITB, which is a home builder ETF, you know, so strong. Really, the fourth quarter of last year, first half of this year, into July, August, just an incredibly consistent uptrend. And then that all changed, right? August, September, October, 
particularly weak. But if you look at Pulte Homes today, up about 5% back above the 50-day uh, moving average. Here's Lennar, actually still below the 50-day, but got above the 200-day uh, today, up about 4.3%. Here's the ITB, which is a uh, broader uh, home builder ETF. And again, you know, testing the 200-day moving average from below. So again, for now, I'm okay labeling these as sort of a counter-trend rally, but we start regaining at moving average resistance. We start gaining above trend lines, which arguably a chart like Pulte Homes is starting to do. That's what tells you things are starting to improve. Also look at the momentum, right? The RSI is getting above 60 today on this rally. Uh, so you're seeing an improvement in momentum. So a space to watch, certainly. Home Builders is a space we've been highlighting as a weaker area in the last couple months. Maybe this is the beginning of uh, that next leg higher. We shall see. A couple of uh, stocks gapping that I just want to highlight to finish off here. Train Technologies TT. This is a building materials name within the industrial sector. Gapping higher today, uh, up about 12% on, uh, on earnings. And again, this was a fairly weak chart about a week ago, right? You sort of traded lower, made a new swing low, undercut previous support around 195, testing the 200-day moving average today, gapping higher. And I wanted to highlight this chart, not necessarily that I think it's the best idea I've ever seen, but the fact that we've gapped higher and we've rallied up to a significant resistance level. Here we're at the long-term highs around 210. So one of two things happened after this big gap higher up again, double digit percentage wise today. Either we see additional buyers come in, we gap higher, and then you see further buying through the course of the week, Thursday and Friday, which I think will be a very bullish indication if we're able to get above resistance and stay there, right? We're able to follow through. Or today's big gap higher starts being sold and Thursday, Friday, you start to see distribution. You're unable to hold 210 on a stock like TT. I think it's right at that key moment where either we validate this breakout as the beginning of something more, or this was just an initial reaction, but the weight of the overall uh, broader uh, negative stories uh, take hold here. And that's other, not the only name to highlight. I think Garmin very much in the same uh, boat. A little stronger move today, up about 11%, but really getting above resistance here. You look around 107, 108. That was resistance in July, August, September, really October, and then today gapping higher. A nice move higher, and again, nice win. But the question is, does it hold it, right? Do we get that follow through Thursday and Friday? So you have some of these initial movers uh, gapping higher. In bullish phases, if things really are getting better between now and your end, breakouts should hold, right? Breakouts should be sustained because additional buyers are thrilled to own more of a company that's working. In a bearish phase, you get a lot of failed breakouts. And that's why I think these two stocks, TT and Garmin, might be interesting to watch through the remainder of this week and beyond. That's it for our market recap. Again, a lot to unpack uh, with the Fed, with the Treasury markets, uh, with earnings, and so forth. That's our uh, technical review of what we're seeing. We're going to bring on today's guest, Katie Stockton, here in a moment. Before we do so, a couple quick announcements. First off, we would love to hear from you. We have a live chat going in our show right now. We also, uh, as always, are looking at the comments you drop below our videos on our YouTube channel. And, of course, email. Totally fine. So if you have a question on the Stock Charts platform, on technical analysis, on market dynamics, whatever it is, we are here for, uh, here for you. The final bar at stockcharts.com is our email address, and we'll be looking for your questions for our next mailbag segment. Also, as a reminder, we have a second channel called Stock Charts. This is where we focus on some documentary-style content. We have a really cool documentary that uh, Abara, one of our producers, created about the panic of 1907. If you're wondering why financial crises are a thing and why we can look back, back at a playbook and what has happened in previous financial crises. You need to learn about the panic of 1907 and other financial shocks in market history. A lot of parallels between 1907 and the 2000s if you go back to that. So make sure you check that out. A lot of other great content on our other uh, channel called Stock Charts. I want to welcome on today's guest, Katie Stockton. Katie's the founder of Fair Lead Strategies, coming to us from their new offices in Greenwich, Connecticut. Katie, great to see you. Welcome back. Good to see you too, Dave. Congrats on your success. I know the uh, TAC ETF is continuing to grow, and I know you've done, uh, you guys and the team have done a great job uh, trying to get some good performance in a challenging tape. Let's talk about the market environment here. We're looking at your weekly chart of the S&P 500. Is this sort of tactical rally that we're starting to see this week something to believe in or something to question? What's your long-term uh, perspective say here? You know, I, I feel like we'll know by Friday, <laughs> so I'm not ready to make that call yet. We do still have Apple's earnings to absorb mm. tomorrow. And that is really a big deal because obviously it's a bellwether. It's the number one constituent of the S&P 500. It is very, very important that we do see a relatively strong close for the week because last week we saw 
the S&P 500 come decisively below some support that we were watching, which is roughly 4180. And it's based on that 38.2% Fibonacci retracement level. And it's a key level. It somewhat aligns with the former resistance, which was roughly 4195. So that's been our mm -hmm. support zone for a long time. And we never say, okay, well, if something dips below for a day or, or two days, even that that's a breakdown when we're talking about a major level, you know, it's part of our discipline to always wait for confirmation. So we've said, okay, well, if we see two weekly closes below, well, then we have a breakdown. And, and that, of course, puts a lot of pressure on the market to sustain this up move that we've seen this week uh, by the close on Friday. It's so, uh, I think uh, I've, all, I've mentioned that bear market rallies, which potentially this is one of them, we'll see as, as the week goes on, but I always say they're sudden, severe, and seductive. How do you, in, a, in an environment where the market, the sort of that medium term trend has gone lower, but all of a sudden you're seeing a big influx of buying, how do you differentiate the viable rallies in this environment versus a, 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 you know, one more validation that the medium term trend is down. Is it something like a key level like 4180 and just if that's holding or how are you looking at, at this particular week here? Yeah, I mean, we use a lot of technical indicators, as you know, in our work and, and our primary one for timing entries like this would be the stochastic oscillator. And we're using it within the context of our longer term trend following gauges. The stochastics are oversold from an intermediate term perspective, also from a short term perspective coming into this week. And so when we look at the weekly bar charts like this one, we do have an oversold condition to enhance the possibility of a low and where we feel like we have a sustainable bounce that we can at least take advantage of with the short term outlook. That means we have a stochastic upturn back above 20 percent. So we like mm. to see that on the charts as something that might add a little long more than just a several day relief rally. We can also use the DeMarc indicators to that end because they'll give you a sense of if something's overdone on the downside and give you some indication perhaps also of duration of the next move. I, I mean, really anybody can take advantage of it. It just is a matter of how nimble they are and uh, maybe a little bit how, how lucky they are um, in terms of their market timing, because it is really cap hard to capture these moves that can be fast and furious. But I, I would also say that to your point, um, you know, sudden and severe, it, it's true in a bear market cycle, if you see a knee jerk reaction, it often fails very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. So if we do see this rally fail very quickly, that would be bearish, I think, as a takeaway because you know you tend to see violent counter trend moves. So, so that you know leaves the question as to whether this correction is just a correction, or is it the start of a bear market cycle? And we mm. won't really know until we can see if that support level holds. Mm, yeah, well said. And, and again, I feel like we have so many catalysts uh, this week. Apple's earnings, of course, uh, certainly with some significant market moving potential. Let's talk about volatility. You know, I, I, we've been talking about the, the VIX sort of accelerating is down in the low teens, pushed above 20. Now we're seeing this week a, a pullback again in the VIX. What does the volatility now tell you about the conditions here? Well, we've identified most of this year as being in a low volatility regime or cycle. And you can just see that in the way the VIX has sort of traded, looking at moving averages and where it relates to the cloud model, which is, of course, pointing lower above the VIX itself. But what was really fascinating to us was with this recent volatility spike, if you even want to call it that, it wasn't even really a, a big spike, right? But with that spike up into the low 20s, we got this really, really overbought reading in our stochastic mm -hmm. oscillator, which is certainly a relevant indicator as well for the VIX, which isn't like always a trending in, um, instrument. It's more of almost like an EKG, I call it, where we, we are looking at these shocks, right, to the market. And uh, that overbought condition is something that has us paying attention. It suggests that that volatility spike might just be enough to have signified a tradable low for the S&P 500, which of course is inversely correlated. Mm. Yeah, that's really, really helpful. I hadn't looked at the VIX or the, uh, the, the stochastics on the VIX. It's actually a really good way and it, it lines up with uh, October of last year at the low. That was the last time you sort of had the yeah, uh, stochastics Yeah, and you can also see 
that you, it doesn't stay overbought for very long, right? Yeah. It's usually spiking and it, even just above 50% on the stochastic oscillator, it stays there for maybe two weeks at most. So mm. we suspect that, uh, you know, we'll see a positive reaction from equities, but it really has to happen immediately, right? So it yeah. seems to be underway as we speak, but it needs to be sustained for this week. And of course, we'd also like to see the follow through next week. Mm. We have the chart of the XLK. Obviously, we have uh, you know one of the biggest components, Apple, reporting here uh, later this week. Overall, what does the trend in technology tell you? Is there an opportunity here? I think so. I mean, we have seen consolidation in tech as the rest of the market has corrected, especially in relative terms. So uh, that that consolidation to us still looks like what has been like a pause to refresh perhaps the uptrend. So we are viewing the corrective phase as constructive, both in absolute and relative terms at this time. That means large cap technology versus the S&P 500 looks healthy as that ratio gets up to a new high trying to push out of its consolidation, uh, we, we usually are, are trusting uptrends until they tell us otherwise. And certainly this trend has not turned to the downside where we have seen some weakness uh, unfold. As you can imagine, looking at market breadth indicators, mm. the small cap tech benchmarks don't look exactly like this, as you can imagine, <laughs> right? We have this uh, pullback that's much more pronounced, both in absolute and relative terms. So the small cap tech, and I'd extend that even further to small cap growth versus value, is really at a proving ground. And it emphasizes, again, that importance that we see this immediate reaction to the oversold conditions that we have in measures of, say, small cap growth to value or small cap tech to the broader market and uh, you know to enhance what we have here from the large caps, which we already know to be a good uptrend, solid uh, relative performance, of course, year to date uh, with now a, a potential breakout underway. Mm. It's interesting, you mentioned the small cap uh, technology and, and we've, we've talked about um, you know, the Russell 2000, obviously kind of at the lows while the S&P, the NASDAQ kind of pulling back kind of this tactical decline you have the IWM or the Russell 2000, you know, testing basically the lows over the last couple of years. How important is a recovery in small caps to a bullish thesis going forward? Is it a vital component? Is it just more descriptive of the type of leadership? How are you looking at small caps here? Yeah, I mean, they are reflective in a way of market breadth, right? And also a way like an indication of risk appetite as well. It's not all about yield. So, so we do feel like it's important to see broader participation. And it doesn't mean we'll see necessarily outperformance by, say, IWM versus the spiders, but we would want to see at least participation on the upside, right? So in, in absolute terms, you'd want to see an oversold bounce there. And it, it's also essential because support is, again, in line effectively for IWM and even equal weighted uh, S&P 500 benchmarks. So it's essential that we get that bounce in order to prevent big breakdowns because these are long-term trading ranges that have been intact for close to a year and a half or so. And if they resolve lower, that to us is a long-term setback. So short-term oversold bounce is really very important to the long-term health of the market. And mm. I also think it'd be hard to imagine an equity market, let's look out to 2024, that's again just driven by large cap technology. We would expect if it's going to be a sustainable uptrend that we have, that we'll see better performance from other sectors as well. And of course, other uh, market caps as well. So that that's the question mark, right? Because we have the potential for a short-term relief rally perhaps here. And yet, uh, you know, resistance is quite strong. And as we were discussing earlier, the longer term indicators would and we look at the monthly chart as one for the S&P 500, we have some downturns that are our potential overhangs beyond the short term. Mm, really, really helpful. Um, tell me this, when, when we're looking at um, uh, positioning, right? I mean, with a lot of uncertainty right now, we have, I mean, just this week, we've got the Fed earnings, geopolitical events that, you know, certainly seem to be escalating. How do you position yourself in this sort of environment? Are there areas, uh, technology you mentioned, other areas where you see opportunities or where you would feel comfortable taking a position given the uncertainty going forward here? 
you know, we are comfortable taking positions in conservative sort of hedged equity types of strategies that would include our own ETF TAC, which has the ability to move into different asset classes to manage risk. We're also comfortable adding exposure to, to higher beta areas of the market if we see that successful test of support. So we need a little bit more, I'd say, of a proof point if you're thinking about adding a new position and say, you know, software or cloud computer. I would probably wait to make sure that we have some support discovery in here, mm. uh, but I do think we'll have that op opportunity at least short term uh, to rebuild some of that higher beta exposure to take advantage of a relief rally. But for now, we're kind of sticking to the core long exposure in general. We're not necessarily adding new exposure until we see that that support discovery is, is squared away. Mm. And then we're also interested in other asset classes. We just had an idea out today in Uranium, the URNM, the ETF. Uh, that's an interesting chart to us. It looks almost like a cup and handle. I'm not a big price pattern person, but it has that nice shape to it. Uh, we like natural gas as a rounded basing phase. And, uh, you know, gold has reversed an intermediate term downtrend. So that's interesting to us. We have some bullish ac action from steel stocks. Um, so there's little mm. spots of strength here and there. And um, what I'll put out there is, is in terms of treasury bonds, the long-term treasury bond, of course, has been in a, a long-term downtrend at this stage. We do actually have, for the first time this month, i.e. Uh, November, we have some signs of downside exhaustion on on the monthly chart. And that's something that they're not really squared away at. This is based on the DeMarc indicators, but it could be something that actually gives us a, a more sort of sustainable opportunity to counter trend the treasury bond market. Mm, a little relief for higher rates potentially in our future. We'll see if that plays out. Katie, that this has be been great, a yeah. pleasure as always. So great to get some charts and some insights from you. Wish you guys the best. Uh, and wish the team there at Fairlead uh, all the best. We'll see you again soon, all right? Thanks so much, Dave. You too, take care. That's Katie Stockton. Katie's the founder of Fairlead Strategies, the portfolio manager of the TAC ETF. Uh, and again, I've known Katie for, for a long time, and she's just a really good, thoughtful patient. I love, she has such a diplomatic way of describing a very uncertain, very calming voice in this sort of uh, uh, market environment. But it, what's so interesting to me out of all of those things, two, two main takeaways. Number one, a focus on long-term charts. In this tactical rally, we're talking about a lot of uncertain short-term movements. Katie's dropping weekly and even some monthly charts and thinking about the big picture and how that's evolving. I think it's a great takeaway from our conversation. Also at the end, she managed to identify a number of charts that are actually working pretty well. And it's a great reminder that in any environment, I think charts are such a great way of helping you focus on where the opportunities really are. So great opportunity to use the scanning engine, use alerts to focus on actionable movements and things that are really in constructive environments and constructive phases, regardless of the market environment. Great take there by Katie Stockton at Fairlead Strategies. Folks, we've got to wrap the show. We go to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. I'm inspired after talking with Katie and seeing some of our charts earlier today, looking at the Ichimoku cloud. Katie's always used the, uh, the cloud model and I've often after talking with her and looking at some of her charts of thought, it's it's some it's great a way, just a great way of visually representing the trend over time. Now, if you're not familiar with the Ichimoku cloud, this is a traditional Japanese form of technical analysis. Actually, predates a lot of the tools and techniques that uh, that we uh, use in Western technical uh, analysis. Uh, but basically, where the price is uh, relative to this cloud is a is an important factor, and it's a trend following indicator but it's actually plotted in the future. It's one of the few technical indicators that actually has a 26 day forward looking uh, thing. So it's basically looking at the trends now and projecting where uh, future f support and resistance may lie. And you look for when we break out of that cloud. For now, the daily chart below that cloud model since September, another thing to look at to see if we're able to recover and get above that cloud resistance. Chart number two, insurance stocks. As a quick preview, earlier today, Grayson Rose and I sat down to review our top 10 charts to watch in November of 2023. We'll be airing that special episode on Friday. One of the sectors or one of the groups that came up was insurance stocks. And I'd encourage you to think about the insurance space. Financials as a whole, rough sector. Big uh, money center banks, regional banks struggling quite a bit. Uh, but insurance companies, kind of an outlier as a positive uh, set of trends within a challenged sector. The KIE, maybe not my favorite chart of all times, but sort of holding up while the rest of the market has been struggling. That's why the relative strength is so impressive. And that is, I think, 
the essence of a, uh, of a, strong, uh, a strong outlook for something like insurance. KIE is the ETF we're looking at there. Finally, the bond ETF. I didn't know that Katie was going to say that at the end. I'm thrilled that she did. Talked about some exhaustion signals on the monthly DeMarc indicators. I'll have to take a look and see uh, exactly what those are, are identifying. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm focusing as I'm thinking of the Fed, as I'm thinking of the big picture of rates. You know, Powell talked a lot about how higher rates, sustained higher rates, are having that impact of slowing economic conditions, or they are expecting that to continue to, uh, to, to play out. What you're actually seeing, though, I think is signs of potential mean reversion. It's not really happening yet, but I am seeing a bullish divergence on the TLT. Lower lows in price, higher lows in momentum. And that usually is a good sign of, a, uh, of an exhaustion point in a bearish trend. Certainly something to watch could mean, at the very least, a pop higher in uh, bond prices and a pop lower in that 10-year yield that we've been talking about. Folks, that's a wrap for this show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. A special thank you to Katie Stockton of Fairlead Strategies joining us live from Greenwich, Connecticut. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our channel while you're here. We would so appreciate it. For Stock Charts and Rem in Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.